Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so I, I guess I'm just starting the meeting to, uh, to tell you what the enacting language says. Um, and part of that language says that you all need to elect a chair and, and a vice chair. So I think that would be the next step after this. Um, so this language, the Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee, um, was part of Act 187, which actually um, had a health care focus, um, but this language was added in. So that was the, an act relating to health information technology and health information exchange. And just for some context, this committee actually uh, existed in the past. And it was first um, enacted in a, a somewhat different form in 1994, and then that was sunset in 1996. And my um, understanding of this language in creating this committee now was that some of the same responsibilities from what the committee did uh, back then is passed over into this new language, although there are some differences. Um, so the purpose of the committee, um, you'll see in, it's very broad <laughs> language. Um, so in subsection A, uh, the committee is created to oversee um, investments in and use of IT in Vermont. And um, <laughs> The membership is uh, three members of the House and three members of the Senate. And in subsection C, under the <coughs> powers and duties, again, these are all very broad uh, powers and duties. There, um, the committee is overseeing, evaluating, and making recommendations on uh, primarily four broad areas. The first is the state's uh, current uh, use management and oversight of IT in government activities. And that very broadly includes um, data processing systems, which could be hardware and software, so pretty much any, anything that processes data, um, telecommunications networks, and related technologies. And then there is language on line 22 that says, Particu particularly with regard to issues of compatibility among existing and proposed technologies. And I think that is referring to how new systems, um, adding new systems onto our existing systems and how they work together. The other three duties are um, issues relating to storage, maintenance, and access to privacy of and restrictions on the use of computerized records. So that is really focusing on access control and um, the retention of, of data. The third is issues of public policy relating to development and promotion of um, both private, commercial, and nonprofit information infrastructure in the state and its relation to the state's um, information technology infrastructure, as well as integrating this with national and international information networks. So that um, also is incredibly broad. Um, and then finally, cybersecurity, which is how um, the state builds security. Um, with respect to its uh, IT networks and in infrastructure. And I would mention here that this language under these duties is referring to state government. It doesn't specifically say the executive branch, but I, I wanted to note that there is a legislative information technology committee that does have some oversight over the legislative branch. So. Um, it's not entirely clear how the two committees interact, but I just wanted to mention that other committee in case you are not all aware of that. Uh, okay, I would like clarification on that, and I guess maybe given it, I did see on the legislative website that there had been a joint information technology committee that met all through last winter. Actually, Chris, you were on it. And so is that a difference, or was that supposed to be just related to the legislature? Or this is yeah. Just to be yeah, this is just related to the legislature. Um, it's called the Legislative, legislative. IT mm -hmm. Committee, okay. I think. It's about a, this stuff, among others. 
Basically, I, I was on it uh, for, I don't know, four years, and it, t it typically just looked at things that related to the legislature's use of information technology. And it, was, it got into, you know, our, our use of iPads, our for use example, of iPads started and there. Programs to use the websites, yeah. stuff like that. But it's very limited, and it really is, is not, I don't think you consider an oversight committee as, as, this, as this was envisioned. Representative felt this may be one way to think of it is it's not too different from the way we have a, a legislative council committee that oversees the legislative <coughs> council. Okay. In a sense, we're, and it's a little murkier, but we oversee the, the, the IT staff that services the state house. I see. Okay. All right. So, yes, the second is fine. Rebecca, uh, item number two, where issues related to the storage of maintenance of access to your privacy. It doesn't specifically say within that of state records. No, it doesn't. So, uh, but was it the intent of the legislation at that point to restrict it to state records? Because otherwise, it's a pretty broad net. I don't, I, I don't actually recall there being any testimony on this. I, I can say that this is one of the pieces of language that was in the original um, the language for the committee back in 1994. Um, I don't know how helpful that is. I can I can look into whether the intent back then, but um, the testimony was limited with respect to. This Although, uh, if you look at Vital, um, those are private records, and we have that Vital is really is generated from the legislature, and then the record storage and. Uh, information is something that we've had oversight on. So I would say the broadness of this statement is probably a good thing because it does allow for us to move into an analysis of vital, among others. So just, just as an example. Uh, so moving on to subsection. Um, D on line eight, uh, the assistance of the committee, there, the JFO and Lunch Council um, provide administrative, technical, and legal assistance. Um, then res with respect to meetings, um, the committee uh, has to elect a chair and a vice chair and adopt rules of procedure. And the chair will rotate biennially between the House and Senate members. A majority of the membership uh, constitutes a quorum. And then finally, the committee can meet when the General Assembly is not in session. And then the last piece is uh, reimbursement. So uh, when you're not meeting in session, uh, members can get reimbursed for being here. So I understand the timeline. So the biennial, biennially, biannually reorganizing. Does that mean that basically we exist for the next three months and then it starts again? Yes. I think because it was created. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, I, I, that's my assumption. Mm -hmm. In June, then that would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> So I would like to nominate Randy Brock as chair. For the next three months. <laughs> <laughs> For the short term. Do we have a house member as chair? Yeah. And then, and then Paul said, all those in favor, say aye. Um, so 
vote to yeah. do it that way? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So all those in favor? Is, well, are there any other nominations? Yeah. All okay. those in favor? Say aye. Uh, aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. And then it's up to you to uh, run for the vice chair. Right, then I think the next uh, uh, order of business is to elect a vice chair and any nomination for vice chair. Typically, be a House, house member. I, I, right. if you, so I'll nominate Laura Sevilla. Any other nominations? I'll second the nomination. Are there any other nominations? <laughs> then uh, we should have a vote. And uh, all those in favor of Laura Sevilla as vice chair? Aye. 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 Just yeah. vice chair. Laura, you want to come sit here? Three months. Do you want to come sit here? Not necessarily. Yes. Move down. I don't want to leave. I mean, you're perfectly right. Okay, that's nice. No, is that it? I don't think that far ahead. <laughs> Is a little bit to capture more of the side, okay? Good. So, Chair, your first uh, witness is first quiz is ready to go. The up what update on the statewide internet outage, which we've all been waiting anxiously to hear about. Did you bring the squirrel with you? The squirrel is decomposing. Uh, would anyone like a paper copy? Yes, please. Yep. We're hearing from John Quinn, the Secretary of the Agency of Digital Services, uh, perhaps with Darwin Thompson also, or? Or not. Uh, or not. Or not. Okay. So, first, for this. You don't have any. Yes, I do. I can throw one to For the record, I'm John Quinn. I'm the Secretary of Digital Services in the state CIO. And um, Shared Services Director Thompson appears to be running a little late, so um, I, I, can, I should be able to cover any questions that you have, but anything uh, too technical, I can always um, get back to you with an answer um, if, I, if I don't know. So as most of you read, um, actually first I'd like to take a minute and uh, thank the legislature for standing up this IT oversight committee. I think that um, ADS certainly welcomes it and we look uh, forward to a collaborative uh, partnership and uh, um, guidance and oversight by the committee. I think it's needed and I think um, it'll make my job a little easier in the long run. So I certainly appreciate um, all of you that um, helped stand this up and your time on this board. <clears throat> so on Wednesday, um, August 8th, we had a um, squirrel chew through a uh, fiber optic line in Essex Junction. Uh, the fiber optic line was owned by First Light, which is our uh, main internet service provider. Our second internet ser service provider, we had redundant lines, um, was Sovernet, who was um, earlier bought out by First Light. So both, both lines were owned by the same company, um, but we were guaranteed diverse routes, which means that they went out from different locations. So if one line went down, the other line would stay up. Um, um, a, as you can see from the timeline, a number of steps took place um, it, as a matter of you know, coincidence or, or bad timing. Our senior um, network engineers were both on the road and uh, weren't in the office when this <coughs> happened. So uh, internet outage happened. Both lines went down. The people in the office assumed it was because of the, the, the squirrel, and which is partially true. But our redundant line also went down. And it was uh, a few hours before 
uh, first light technicians and state of Vermont technicians were able to identify why traffic wasn't passing out of that second route. Because up to that point, we've done, we've done testing between our data centers. We've shut data centers down, bailed over back and forth, and data's always passed out both paths. We, we have never shut down the first light circuit and left the other circuit open, uh, meaning we have never actually tested um, only one internet path at a time. We felt that we had done that through the data center failovers and shutdowns. So uh, here's where it gets a little technical. I'll, uh, I'll try to stay um, as high as I can, but each, each path to the internet has a default route which tells it, and, and a routing table which tells it where to go out. We had a default route uh, that was set by the internet service provider on the first light circuit. On our SovereNet circuit, when it was put in place, it was ordered uh, about two years ago, no default route was ever set. Our uh, network engineering team did not have the, the skill sets by their own words to understand um, how, to, how to figure out whether or not there was a default route or whether or not it was needed, unfortunately. So um, after working together with First Light, troubleshooting between the network engineering teams, uh, they discovered that the default route on the first light sign was broken because of the squirrel outage and the Sovereignet side, side didn't have a default route. It, it was uh, previously getting its default route from the first light side. So it gets a little complicated on where it lives and how that uh, default route is, is pushed, but it's pushed from the vendor to our equipment. Think of it like a projector. Um, it's, it's mirroring an image onto our equipment that allows our equipment to know where to go to get out to the internet. When that light was broken, or that image was broken, this, this uh, ISP no, knew, no longer knew how to get to the internet. So um, once we put in a default route, we were able to come back up with uh, one of our internet circuits, and a few hours later, uh, First Light was able to repair the, the other um, Fiber, fiber break from the squirrel um, cut. I know that there's been a number of uh, crazy stories that have gone around about what really happened and how it happened and um, you know, so I included the timeline from First Light as well as the picture of the squirrel break. Just so there's no you know, misinterpret, misinterpretation of what actually happened. That was the course of events. Since then, we've, we've debriefed, we've done the lessons learned internally, we've spoken with First Light a few different times, and we've, um, we've added an additional internet service provider to our equipment. Um, we bought additional equipment, so now we have a First Light circuit, a SovereNet circuit, and a, a VTEL circuit. So we have three different paths. Um, and those paths um, go out through Albany, Montreal, Boston, and New York City. So um, I, I could say that we've learned a lot from this incident. It was a lot longer than um, um, I had hoped for, um, but uh, I think we're better positioned now than, than we have been um, in previous years. So essentially there was a configuration issue, a configuration error that affected the uh, backup through Sovereignet. And that, that was the reason that you were not able to switch over to an alternate service provider once the break happened? That's correct. Okay. And uh, now that you have uh, determined that that was a problem, you mentioned that that was a problem because there was uh, a lack of expertise or sufficient expertise at the time it was set up within the agency. Uh, has the expertise in the agency changed since then to well, give you assurance that you don't have other issues like this uh, where things have were, in, con were configured improperly, uh, thereby exposing us to, to, to another failure of a different kind? I asked that question again this morning, and, and the, the lessons learned, yes, we have uh, figured out how to run those commands and how to uh, properly test the different channels and the different failure points. Um, but overall, you know, we, we are still uh, lacking um, the, the most senior engineering skills um, 
in, a, in our position. Um, and what I mean by that is we, we don't necessarily have uh, network architects that can really put together the, the whole puzzle and make sure that uh, we're 100% we're positioned correctly. Uh, we're, we're working with our internet service providers to do back and forth with them consulting to make sure that uh, from their standpoint we're configured but this is this isn't a new problem this is certainly something that uh, we've uncovered as a new agency and are looking to fix but um, this is years and years of, of uh, bad practice so two questions I just want to clarify uh, you added you said that we have connections, Albany, Montreal, and New York City? Albany, Montreal, Boston, and New York oh, City. Boston and New York City, okay. And which one was the new? Did you add? Did you say you added a new connection? Vitel. Of those Vitel. four? Vitel. Okay. No, okay. Yep. And then um, regarding the lacking network, that skill that you were just talking about, is that something that we will be seeing coming forward, recommendations to add that skill? Or is that something we're looking to contract? How will we be dealing with that? Um, we're going to do more training with our internet service providers and our partners to make sure that uh, not only we have a good architecture um, design and that we understand all the different pieces and how they work, and um, but you know we'll, we'll offer we'll offer to send them to to training to make sure that they understand the newest technologies. As these technologies change, we're gonna to need to keep these skill sets up because as we saw, you know, this is a, this, these are critical positions to our, um, to the state of Vermont. And are, so I just wanna make sure I'm clear, are we looking to build that capacity within yes. Vermont state government or within our partners? W within Vermont state government. Okay, thank yep. you. So uh, as we, as the whole industry matures, then the knowledge that we need to do this work will also mature. I know it's it's easy to say, well, we didn't do it ten years ago or twenty years ago, but things have really moved quite fast. Is uh, ha, do we have a, a system in place to test redundancies of for all of these different? locations and cables that we now have. Are we testing the redundancy of the system on a regular basis or is that something we don't do and we wait for an emergency? A lot of our system doesn't have redundancy built into it. And so in this particular area now you're saying that with VTEL that is redundant? Is that a new redundancy? What I'm, I'm trying to clarify what it is and that we now have that we did Yes, an additional an additional um, internet service provider to provide additional redundancy onto the two lines that we already had. We added a third line okay. in case at some point down the line, the, um, um, you know, without any knowledge of this, I'll just use the companies that we're talking about. If First Light and Sovereignet um, end up using the same piece of fiber somewhere down near New York City, if they channel through each other and that fiber's um, chewed into, um, you know, that's still a problem. Um, and we've been working with the internet service <coughs> providers to try to figure out, <clears throat> okay, so it leaves here, it goes here, and then it goes to New York City, where does it go from there? To see if we can figure out exactly what the paths are. Um, when, it's, uh, when it's on the internet service provider's side, that it's not always clear how we're getting to our final destination. And the, our providers are talking with one another about this? Or is that the job, of, is that your job? That's our job. Uh, Representative Felters. Well, related to that, then, our thinking that's our job, you're talking about the senior architecture expert who would understand where all of these connections go. Our network engineering team. Okay, and your network engineering team, you mentioned you wanted to get them additional training so yes. that they would be able to solve this kind of problem in the future. So the answer, I guess, to the question of how we might employ this in the future from our own personnel perspective is that our current personnel will have better training, understand it better, and we're not necessarily going to add new personnel. Is that the case? Or we're, we're not necessarily going to add new personnel. We've had um, a number of positions change, o 
changeover over the past few years. Um, the, the original configurer and buyer of um, that second circuit no longer works for us. So we continually have changeover throughout our agency and it's common in, in fairly large uh, organizations. But uh, we'll continue to provide training to the team so we're best equipped to handle the issues like this. Can to do that? Um, from time to time, you know, the, the field is a little limited, but um, as a new agency, uh, I think uh, a lot of the outside candidates are seeing ADS as an attractive place to work. We've hired some very good people, and we have some very good people in our networking group that are very experienced, but were either on the road or, you know, just said, you know, it's something that we've never dealt with. We've never had an issue with the default route. We can't find the record on whether or not we told the service provider to add the default route or not. So there's some steps like documentation that we can absolutely do that will help us identify, was this a sovereignty issue? Did they not add the default route even though you know, we didn't ask for it? The default routes needed in order, in order to get to the internet. Why wasn't it there? So uh, I, I think there's a number of things we can do internally. But and, and internally, you do have qualified candidates who certainly can take on new training and understand this problem and be able to resolve it. Yes, ma'am. Representative Kimball. I have a, a few questions. One around um, just the overall structure of your department, and the second about the impact of the incident. So, if, if we're talking about the structure of the department, I think earlier in the spring we talked about I think 380 people work in the Agency of Digital Services now. Yes. So it's one of the fastest growing agencies. I, I guess one of the questions that I have is instead of hiring and training, um, because you're gonna have to keep up with technology on a rapid basis, I think as uh, Representative Sedilia was saying, would you just, well, how much would you rely on your third party vendors to provide that expertise and have the ability in-house to actually evaluate whether or not they know their stuff? So I would just caution you before you hire somebody to train them to, to look to see what you can do there. I mean, <coughs> uh, and I imagine you still have a number of open positions within your agency as well. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> so, you know, one of, the, one of the great things about our new agency and bringing in um, approximately 300 people uh, into, in merging them with what was the Department of Information and Innovation, we have about 380 still. Um, that number has not increased. We have um, reclassified uh, positions as, as they've come open to reprioritize the work to make sure that the uh, priority areas are being addressed and that we have adequate staffing. I think um, the, the last brief I got was about six weeks ago and we had reclassified 29 openings, which uh, we believe was a vacancy savings of you know, about a quarter million dollars, reclassifying into proper positions lower positions so we can build that skill set in in house where we don't necessarily uh, or we can't necessarily find candidates on the outside so we've done a number of things to address um, the inside structure and that we never um, immediately go out to hire without uh, reviewing the position now all the positions that come open go through my office so we can review each one to make sure that aligns with our priorities and, and strategy going forward. So just a follow up on that, if I may, Mr. Chair, because I've got two more questions. I think you entered into an agreement with Norwich University for cybersecurity, right? We, um, we are uh, working on a contract right now. Okay, will that replace people you have on staff, or is that a contract in addition to what you're currently doing internally? It's in an addition. It's a, it's, um, a security operations center. It'll be staffed 24/7. Right now, we have a model of eight to five, which means you know, um, yeah. Yeah. You know our guys are there yeah. from eight to five. You know, two thirds of the world is um, getting up and awake when we're going home. Right, and squirrels are up a lot. Right. Uh, so, the, about the squirrel, just the the impact. What was the impact on the state government? I mean, um, are what was, have you done a calculation, has anybody done a calculation of loss of productivity in terms of total cost impact? Were checks not cut? Did people not get their benefits? Uh, were employees idle for a day? What was the impact? Um, so the, so I'm gonna address it in two ways. The impact of the citizens of the state where they could not get to state service websites. So if they wanted to make a payment or renew 
uh, registration of their car or something like that. They were not able to do that for the five and a half or six hours that we were down. Um, so direct effect to the citizens was the, was the websites. Um, did we do an in, inside assessment of what the total dollar projected loss was? No, but we did um, um, talk extensively with different agencies about uh, continu continuity of operation planning and and how we how we do this going forward or or how we um, continue our work if there are issues in the in the future I've, I've met with uh, public safety they have a number of um, radio towers and, and internal fiber and we've you know discussed at least at a high level right now uh, potential contingency plans for public safety if something like this was to happen uh, we are not aware of any public safety um, issues when I say issues no death resulting or anything like that through this outage um, internally it was hard to uh, come up with a dollar amount we, we talked about it and because um, there's still quite a bit of work that's form based paper based uh, truck drivers BGS those type of uh, jobs that don't necessarily rely on the internet it was really hard to come up with a uh, semi-accurate number well, I think I'm building up some of the questions, but it seems obvious to me that internally we need to have a way to evaluate what the vendors are giving us. But it's a little puzzling to me that this wouldn't fall under the vendor responsibilities. Of, you know, clearly our secondary backup failed us. So, so you know, can you explain to us? And then you added a third. I, I, I'd like to understand why we added a th third. Did we make sure the second was now functioning? And, and then what did we do with that vendor? I mean, if they, if I'm hearing you right, their entire job was to be the secondary backup, and that didn't work. So, do we get money back? Do we, you know, how does that negotiation work? Mm -hmm. um, so. What I would say is that we have a contract with, with the company and there's an SLA in the contract. So there was some of that. Service level agreement. Service level agreement. So there was a, a dollar amount that we received back uh, due to the outage or that we're working on getting back due to the outage. Um, was it enough? Probably not. Well, it's it's money back from who? From Sovereignite or so from? From First Light. Or from First Light. Yep. But, it's, yeah. but, but the so Sovernet, you, you mentioned that yeah. the Sovernet also failed, that it was a configuration issue, but the configuration issue, if I heard you correctly, was really the state's fault, not the vendor's fault. Well, I've asked that question in, in 10 different ways, and um, I, I think we can't definitively say it was their fault. My feeling, you don't order a internet line without a default route, right? You, you, so we ordered a uh, one gigabyte internet line to the internet. Um, we received that. We received a routing table with it without a default route. It doesn't make sense because without a redundant system, which SovereignNet wouldn't have necessarily known, there was no way for that to work without that default route. So, you know, but my, was contractually were they required to provide that? Or was it not, an assumption it was, that, that they would an, provide it, but not contract It was an specified. assumption. It was an assumption, and that's why we went back through our uh, old <clears> records <throat> and work orders to see, did we specifically say we needed a default route? And we could not find record of that. And therefore, that's why I'm taking mm -hmm. uh, partial responsibility, responsibility as a person accountable for the agency that, um, you know, there's probably a shared responsibility there, not being able to definitively say that they didn't do this. And, and so now we have solved that and added a third redundancy. Is that what yes. you're describing? Okay. Thank you. My, my, for the record, my network team believes it's overkill to have that third, right. third line. But for right now, um, after the incident, I wanted it up. I wanted to make sure we were stable. I did not want another outage. Um, the Secretary of State was doing some important uh, election primary stuff. And the last thing I wanted was for him to not be able to complete that work. So I authorized the third line to make sure that we were stable. And, and do these secondary and third systems, do, do, they, do we pay them according to the idea that we almost never use them? Or how does that work in terms of contract? 
Um, no, if I'm understanding your question correctly, we we are provided um, a rate for the line whether we use it or not. So it, it's it's in our best interest to push um, traffic through those different lines, and uh, this is where it gets a little technical, and I don't know that I'm 100% accurate. So so I hate to say too much, but two of our three lines, the the traffic goes out of right now. The third line, I believe, is sitting there in case one of those two goes down. That's my understanding, but if I'm wrong, my network guy in the back will tell me after, and um, I will send you an email and, and correct myself. So that's who that is. Okay. <laughs> but, but, and not to get into the weeds too much, but yeah. you've got two lines that are being used, and then the other one, by contract, is being held in case. So we have a contract that says it's held in case, we're paying to that, sort of a part-time so is that other line being used by other um, in other service contracts? Is that other line being used? Is the business selling that line? Is the bit no? That's de it's dedicated. It's just to it's us. just totally dedicated. It's there's no information traveling across it until and unless we require that. That's correct. The city okay. it's it's dedicated to the state of Vermont. And is there a regular testing of that line to ensure that it is operating as intended? Our network group has been testing these lines on a regular basis to make sure that we're, we're fully functional if something goes down. In, in terms of, this is, is almost, it wasn't really a single point of failure problem, it was a multiple point of failure problem. And the, the question is, is there any independent, has there been any independent review of uh, resiliency, of, of backup, of, of, of the entire uh, network by some independent party, such as uh, an IT auditor, either from the state auditor's office or contracted uh, to, to take a second look. Has that ever been done? No, but I would certainly welcome it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the questions also, you mentioned that you did not have the expertise at the time that this was set up to give you comfort that things were set up properly. And you talked about training by vendors to provide that. The real question, you know, in my, in my mind is, are you, do you have sufficient expertise to begin with within the department? Because whenever, you know, we contract with anyone to provide services, you look at the hourly rates being paid to the contractors and compare it to what's being paid to state government. I'm wondering, do we have the capability of hiring people at the level needed for the expertise that you require? Um, I can't answer that question definitively, not being a network expert, and that's why one of the reasons why I'd welcome the, the, the audit of the network. I, th I think it would be a, a productive thing to do. And as a new agency, I would certainly welcome that. Um, I feel um, after you know many years of knowing our network team and their skill sets internally that um, they continue to grow and and are um, I consider very good technicians. Um, but is there a level above that, and what is it? I don't necessarily know uh, what I don't know. Well, I guess the question is, are you able to hire people with the expertise that you want at the salaries that we're paying? Um, in some areas. So not, not every IT job is considered equal. Mm -hmm. So uh, IT technician that works on desktops <coughs> and laptops and that type, yeah, we're paying them adequately. For an Oracle database administrator or a, um, a chief information security officer, no. Um, my chief security officer position has been open um, for well over a year. Um, I originally received 42 applicants. We called them and told them the salary range, each one of them, and 40 of them backed out. The two that didn't, uh, one of them was an internal candidate and I hired him as the deputy because I didn't feel he was quite where um, we needed him to be. And the other one uh, snuck through the, the process and wasn't qualified at all. So we've gone back out and we've advertised and I think this time we received eight candidates, uh, five of which backed out immediately um, or weren't qualified and the, the three that we called, two of them backed out. And so I'll be interviewing uh, the one that's left. So this is a, 
This is a problem that we deal with. It's a problem that all states deal with, though. Um, and our salary <coughs> for Vermont, I feel it's good, but these, these um, security professionals are, are paid a lot of money. And uh, we just, you know, we would be, uh, uh, you know, up in the range of the chief medical examiner pay range in order to get someone and keep someone. We, we've all decided it makes sense to have a chief medical examiner. Um, is there some hesitation to boost the salary so that you can have it? This seems like a pretty vital role for state government to me. There certainly is a function within uh, our human resources organizations to deal with pay uh, issues for, for specialized jobs for which the state's pay scale is insufficient, right? I believe because the, the, the next question will be, you know, if this one doesn't work out, what are you going to do right. then? Right. What's, well, they're not what's plan B? Team. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so up to, up to this point, uh, myself and the deputy have been covering the role between policy and operations. If, is there a discussion underway to shift the pay scale to make it attractive? Um, yes, but there's also a budget consideration that we need to address this year as well. So we, we have had conversations about that at the cabinet level and, and how, do we, how do we fill this position long term? Well, I think that you, you, you've indicated that you've got a significant vulnerability and uh, information technology is the backbone that makes state government work or fail to work mm -hmm. as we saw for five hours earlier this month. So I'm just very concerned that you, you, you are covering the position right now with yourself and you mentioned that you don't feel that you're technically qualified in some of these areas, and you've got a deputy that you did not feel was qualified technically to perform the function of chief information officer, and the two of you are functioning as the chief information officer, right. or so, security officer. Right, so I wanna clarify. <coughs> Network engineering is, is different than security policy. Mm -hmm. I am very qualified to cover the security policy piece of it, and my deputy is very qualified to cover the operations piece of it. Network engineering is very, very complicated when you mm -hmm. get into the, um, some of the, the, the challenges and, the, and the, the different protocols and, and ways to configure it. That area, I'm, I'm not an expert in, and I'm not going to pretend like I am. And I, I don't know a CIO that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to clarify that that's, that's, the CIO isn't a technical position. Um, so, so, from from my standpoint, you know, we're we're doing all the right things to try to fill these positions. Um, we had a reclassification of all IT positions. Uh, I'm going to say two years ago, maybe it was three um, mm -hmm. uh, that HR did in conjunction with IT to address the, the pay scale issues. Um, so <coughs> that position. Um, was an exempt position, and I think it was probably missed. So um, it's, it's time to look at it again. So I, I just want to double back on the number of connections. And I don't know if I've asked you this before. Um, in terms of other states, is there a best practice number that other states are employing in terms of their connections? Is it two? Um, is it three? Does it depend on how big they are? Does it depend on how populated they are? I think it depends on how big they are and where their data centers are and where their people are. Um, so I don't know that there's necessarily a best practice on the, the number. Okay. Obviously multiple lines is, is best practice, but. Okay, um, and then my other question is on the staffing issue. Yeah. Um, are you seeing any international applicants? Is that something that the administration is considering? Are you able to try and access um, those types of labor pools? It seems um, in the positions that I review, I have not seen any international candidates. Um, I have met with um, the 50 state CIOs uh, a few times about this issue, and most recently I met with the New England CIOs in Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. Uh, we're all experiencing the same issues right. with hiring. And, and so uh, is there any thought to look at the international labor pool on this? Um, to the, try and fill these positions, or uh, there, there hasn't been. From uh, I haven't thought of that. That's that's not necessarily a, a bad idea, though, and I'll certainly um, okay. consider that. Yeah. Are you able to hire or to fill the position contractually if you aren't able to hire your own employee to do it? 
Um, there are a few different models which we've explored. Uh, Maine's exploring, Illinois is ex exploring um, a CISO as a service, which is the Chief Information Security Officer as a service, which mm -hmm. we would hire them for a set number of tasks for, for a dollar amount. Um, and so that's definitely not um, out of the possibilities. We're trying to find someone that, um, or trying to figure out what that service looks like and what piece we need to cover them, what piece they need to cover. We did try a telecommute um, a couple of years ago and it didn't work out. There was too many things here on the ground that needed to be dealt with. May I shift just for a, another question relating to this uh, Security Operations Center? Yep. Uh, that will be at Norwich. Will that be manned by students? Um, students with uh, direct oversight from skilled security operation personnel uh, made up of uh, Norwich hires, uh, different, different positions that they've hired uh, for this, and uh, some ADS oversight. Will that be oversight and uh, experienced people on duty 24 hours a day or a little, for limited periods of portions of the day since it's a 24 hour operation? So on the ADS side, it will have a playbook that outlines um, when this happens, this is the, here's the, here's the play for you to follow, mm -hmm. which will include a on-call security person at ADS. We will not be uh, going to three shifts mm -hmm. at this point, but we will have someone on call if they see an incident that rises to to the need of uh, needing to be shut down or um, needs further clarification on. In, in the the off hours, uh, will there be a Norwich person there, or will you have a situation in which you have essentially a student manning uh, an operations center uh, during some part of the day unsupervised mm -hmm. or not directly supervised? We're still working out all the details in the, the, the SLA that we're putting together as part of the contract. Mm -hmm. So um, The contract, uh, though, has been done? The contract is not signed yet. It's not so, so I'm hesitant to go into okay. too much, but I will say it's our, our intention that the kids are supervised at all times. Okay, but the there's students. not a the service level agreement. Once that's done, would specify the degree of supervision and... Yep. Any other questions for the committee at this point? Just one quick question on the, on the contract that we're talking about. Are there conditions of liability built into the contract, or will there be? Should there be a failure? So suppose it is a student and there is a failure, and it's the student's responsibility. Are there conditions of liability built into the contract so that Norwich accepts that liability? Those things are still being negotiated in the contract. They're, they're really in a monitoring position. So uh, we'll, the way it works is we'll be putting sensors that will collect data across the state. Um, we have a, enough budget for a certain amount. Um, and so they'll be watching those, collecting the logs. There's way more data than any human eye can look at. So we'll be using tools to collect that data and analyze that data as well. So. Um, you know, with any tool, you know, there's there's possibilities that things will be missed. Um, th this is just another way to mitigate the, the overall risk, but it's not a certainty. There's never a certainty that we're going to catch everything, but this will certainly put us in a much better position. Is there uh, anything that you think is of particular concern from either a security or a reliability or resiliency or contingency planning issue that you feel is important enough to bring to our attention. And if it's something that is non-public, in other words, that it's confidential because of the nature of the security, it might be something that you would bring to us in executive session. Is there anything like that that you want to bring to our attention or yes. should bring to our attention? Yes, um, on both sides. There's some concern. Uh, security things that you should be aware of and understand why I'm doing what I'm doing and why cybersecurity is our top priority. Um, the second, which is also related, is visibility into our network mm -hmm. um, and, and what we can see now. It's been 18 months since we've been a, since we were organized. Um, before that, we did not have a accurate um, 
asset inventory, um, accurate software revisions. We did not know how many applications we had as state government. We did not know a lot about what we have going on. After 18 months, we have a much better picture. It's not 100%, but we know uh, a number of areas where we don't have redundancy and where we have we are prone to um, hardware failure because of uh, the age of our technology and uh, we're putting a plan together that we're going to present to the legislature this year um, in our funding uh, model and this will cover both of these, these these areas yes well the the security incidents will not be uh, publicly disclosed do you think those are something, though, that you should bring to us, to our attention, in executive session, if not necessarily today, in, uh, in at our next meeting? Yeah, I, th I think it would be good for you, for your awareness to be um, to understand what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and the kind of things that we see. I mean, it, it's it's not a matter of uh, you know if it's a matter of when, right? Okay. Representative Kemp, would you? Oh, you answered my question. Okay. Then I have one more. Um, in terms of um, follow-up items, so we've talked about the security, um, the audit of the IT network, you had said that that's something that you would welcome. Is that something that you would be prepared to talk to us um, at a subsequent meeting about what that should entail? Or is that something that you would include in the budget? How should we yeah. handle that? Just talking out loud, it, it seems like um, you know, with with any audit, I wouldn't want to necessarily lead them down one path or another. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, Chairman, please correct me if I'm wrong in any of this. Um, I, I would think an experienced IT um, auditor would would know what to be looking for if we requested a network audit. Well, just a suggestion would be to have a conversation with the state auditor indicating what your concerns are and perhaps indicating that you are looking for some assistance at a high at, at a high level information uh, uh, security review of uh, both the network itself and then also overall of uh, redundancy resiliency backup and security and then suggest that perhaps in a conversation with the auditor to determine what, A, if they're able to help you, and B, what their approach might be, and C, whether or not it's something that could be done internally, and D, whether or not, and there are lots of outside contractors, usually at extremely large amounts of money, who do this kind of work. Right. Okay. And then perhaps, then at, at, at our next meeting, perhaps come back to us with, with, with what you found, and what, what, what if anything, you, you're able to do going forward. Okay. okay. Anything else from the committee? Well, thank you, Secretary Quinn. Appreciate your, your testimony and thank you for being here today. And the right on time. You're right on time. We're right on time. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an update on Coverage Co. and telecommunications planning and uh, uh, Commissioner Tierney and uh, Clay Purvis, uh, Director of Telecommunications for the Department of Public Service are, are here. Please. Thank you. Well, thank you both for being here today. It's a pleasure. Appreciate it. And we hope that perhaps you will just begin and Tell us what you think we need to know. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Chair Brock. Uh, Jim Tierney, Department of Public Service Commissioner, with me, Clay Purvis, the Director for Telecommunications. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, what you need to know is everything that uh, Vermonters ought to know in order to understand uh, the state of the telecommunications, particularly uh, the two subjects you asked about, Coverage Co. and the telecom plan. Um, in a nutshell, uh, since we last saw you, I think last spring, um, we have terminated the contract with Coverage Co. And we have issued an RFP seeking a new vendor to come in and to complete the build out of that system and to manage the system as well. Uh, right now it is not operating and we would expect a new operator to bring it back online. 
Um, we had originally established a September 29 response date for the RFP at the request of at least one bidder. Uh, it was more than one bidder. Uh, we've extended the window for responding to the RFP to October 29. Um, we are hopeful that we will find a contractor. At last count, as far as I recall, we had three responses to the RFP. Um, so uh, stay tuned. On the, the telecom plan, we've made excellent progress in pulling that together. I would like to acknowledge very candidly to the committee that last uh, mm -hmm. legislative session, we represented to you that that plan would be done, that it would be done before the end of the legislative session. We did not meet that goal. In retrospect, I see that I should have been in touch with you over the summer to let you know that. I apologize for not having done that. Um, it literally was uh, just uh, you know, trying to stay on top of many other things as well, but no discourtesy was intended to any of the legislators on that point. Uh, I'm pleased with the progress we've made in putting the plan together, and I do think we are going to have it done in short order, but I don't want to promise to you that it's going to be October 1 or October 31, because I don't want to be in this position again. Clay, perhaps you can speak to when you think the plan will be fully uh, completed. So we're working through our most current draft and we're pulling it together. Um, it is my top priority to get the plan done. I'm um, primarily responsible for its content and its uh, production. So uh, poor June has to um, take the blame for it, but it is, um, it, it is my work and um, it, it is my goal to have that done by the end of October. Um, with so much going on, Coverage Co., um, the other projects that we have going on, it's, uh, it's something that uh, we need to uh, complete and get out to Vermonters as soon as possible. Um, I think um, as much as I appreciate Clay's uh, comments, the responsibility is entirely mine, not his, and I do take that responsibility for the delay. Um, I would point out, too, that we've been down two staff positions in the last month alone. We've had one of our telecom staff mobilized to go to Hawaii in the wake of um, the uh, severe weather that they had there. Uh, this person is a member of the uh, type of team that Vermont Emergency Management mobilizes. And then we have a staff member who is actually our broadband coordinator. Uh, who has uh, taken a position with Vermont Emergency Management. So the good news is we have excellent staff at the department and it gets, uh, unfortunately the bad news, it gets, uh, how do we put it, poached. So anyway, um, I would also add too that part of the issue with the telecom plan is that um, it would be foolish to simply put the plan out without recognition of the debate that was had in the legislature last year. And so some of the content will reflect the conversations that we're having. I have memories of being asked, what is the plan, what is the plan? Um, those uh, questions did not fall on deaf ears. So uh, again, my apologies for the pace of the production, but I think the wait is worth the while. Um, I would also point out to, um, when I came to the position as um, the commissioner was following several years of having been at the Public Utilities Commission as their general counsel, where you live in a rather rarefied circle that is not uh, fully uh, connected to what is happening on the ground. There are many issues that a commissioner deals with, and um, it took a while to get to this issue, um, the connectivity issue, um, for many reasons, but um, I feel I have done a good job of getting my arms around the current state of affairs of telecommunications in the state, and I know it's a matter of great urgency to several members of the committee. What I um, have drawn by way of conclusion is that in our discussions, we lose sight of the significant impediments that we experience here in the state due to decisions that are made at the federal level about funding that ought to be um, available as a straightforward matter uh, to the states in order to do something about rural connectivity. Uh, this is an item on the agenda. Item two, mobility fund phase. Um, we have a staff member who is extraordinarily talented, who has devised a very sound means of challenging basic mapping data that the FCC saw fit to accept from larger carriers earlier this year on the strength of affidavits that they filed, saying that this was the state of broadband of, of connectivity in their respective jurisdictions. 
Um, when we looked at the maps, that was at AT and T or Horizon. I can't. Oh, we probably should not say. Fair enough. Well, um, could you say that in executive session? I'd have to review the non-disclosure agreement that we signed with the FCC. Well, I mean, I'm yeah. going to ask that question later, so we'll hold on. I think I think the way we could talk about it probably is to you know not mention names. But if you'll forgive me, I'll just go to concept here for a moment. We saw maps, and we did not recognize the uh, state of connectivity of Vermont in those maps. And there's a process by which you can challenge those maps. And we are vigorously engaged in that challenge. And uh, to return to my narrative, we have a, a very talented uh, staff member who has come up with a means of challenging and who is literally driving the roads of the state as we speak with uh, a box with a variety of uh, devices in it in order to mount a successful challenge. My point in bringing it up is to say that it shouldn't be this way, but it is the state that we are dealing with. So while we want to have conversations about what are you going to do to get this, that, and the other out, it's important to understand that there's a preliminary um, objective that has to be achieved, which is making sure that our federal partners have the requisite knowledge to give us resources, or better said, to make them available to us to successfully advocate for. And when I came to the department, I will candidly tell you that I did not understand that there is that kind of battle that has to be fought first. To my mind, it's incongruous, but it is true. We, in some respects, are in the position of fighting our own government. But we are taking that fight on, and I might add, um, my memory is that we had outreach from the state of West Virginia. Uh, the state of West Virginia is in the uh, state of Mississippi and New Hampshire. So this is how well our efforts are being received, that uh, sister states are recognizing that they need to do similar things. But that is my way of telling you that this is where a lot of our attention has gone this summer. And when resources are devoted in this manner, which is a worthy thing to do, uh, it does unfortunately put a crimp on other things that we have to do. Um, to return to the agenda here, we've also very recently launched uh, an investigation into consolidated communications and the state of their quality of service. Uh, we tried very hard to take a, a measured approach in exercising our regula regulatory jurisdiction over the company because my experience has been that you often get more results more immediately from a regulated entity if you try to work with them uh, instead of simply dropping the hammer on them. But there came a point where progress had stalled out. We saw a significant spike of uh, service quality complaints to the point where it clearly was a matter that needed to be put in a public forum for the PUC to be able to superintend so that the company understands that this isn't about doing uh, the, the right thing just because they choose a pace or resources, but rather it's because there is um, a, a quasi-judicial entity that is bearing down on them and a, an advocate in that forum who is saying, we've gone as far as we can with our supervisory jurisdiction, it's time to take this to the next level. So that is what we did, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm hopeful that there will be a productive outcome in that um, investigation and that um, we will come get to the bottom of why Consolidated has not so far been able to deliver on its promised level of uh, quality of service. That was a big selling point for us, at least in our support of their um, acquisition of Fairpoint. And it has been deeply disappointing to experience um, what we have so far because as I think I've said to some of you before, when I see you here at these tables, I really don't see you. Uh, I see the people behind you, and uh, those people have been experiencing um, unacceptable uh, issues with their connectivity um, in the course of the summer. Um, I wonder, Clay, if you might speak to the details of the USDA connectivity pilot program, because they're escaping me at the moment. Sure. So the uh, USDA received $600 million this past year to devote to rural broadband. So they'll be building or funding rural broadband projects all across the country. Um, $600 million uh, is a, a significant investment in rural broadband. Um, but the USDA has funded projects in the past, uh, specifically in Vermont. Uh, and it... Um, uh, is prohibited from 
funding projects in census blocks that it is already funded a project and which those uh, loans are in a repayment phase. So we have um, a significant number of census blocks in the states in this state that are covered by an existing project. Um, we filed comments with the USDA um, expressing um, our concern over that issue uh, and uh, asked them to reconsider that policy. Uh, Can you define census block and what, how much population that covers? Is it a geographic area or is it population based? Sure. Um, the, the U.S. Census Bureau um, has, has broken the, down the country into a series of census blocks. In Vermont, we have about 15,000, I believe. Um, they're small. Um, population depends on who lives in the census block. In my particular census block, there are three houses. Uh, in Burlington, there could be you know, 1,000 or 10,000 houses. So um, it all depends on, um, on the area. These census blocks that we're talking about are rural in nature, so they're more like three, five houses. Uh, geographic area, it, it depends again on how the U.S. Census Bureau breaks it down. Some are large, some are small. The ones in urban areas are smaller, of course, than the one uh, census blocks in rural areas. Um, uh, and I apologize, uh, I, I do not remember exactly how many census blocks are affected. We, we did uh, do an analysis uh, of this, um, which I'm happy to provide to the committee at a later point. Uh, just ask a question. Do you have a sense percentage-wise of how many are impacted? No. Ge geographic area, um, maybe about, and it, please don't quote me on this, maybe about <laughs> half the state landmass. Um, we're, we're talking rural areas, though, mm -hmm. so the places that need broadband. Um, and again, I can provide an analysis uh, later. I apologize I didn't bring that with me. Um, but um, in order to uh, avail ourselves of, of that federal funding, it would be necessary to, um, to have the USDA reconsider um, this policy in light of um, the, the great need that we still have in this area. And can you just clarify why we are disqualified? What is the pro is there a project? Are there multiple projects that are disqualified? Is My understanding blocks? is uh, the VTEL Well project. And how much money is, is still out is outstanding as a result of their, those grants? Do you know offhand? I believe those grants have been closed out. They closed out. But how much money did all of that involve? Yeah, so the VTEL WOW project specifically, I believe, was $33 million. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was a fiber to the premises project in Vermont Telephone's uh, traditional exchange territories. That was $80 million. Um, and that was a mixture, I believe, of grants and low-interest loans. The fiber to the premises project, my understanding is that that was successful. On, uh, all the homes that in those exchanges should be served with fiber of the premises. But if I understood you correctly, it's that when there uh, has been a, a project that has been started in which there are funds that are still outstanding, that you can't get additional monies for the census blocks that are affected, is that right? Yes, because- Until those loans are paid back. And I'm assuming that those census blocks are scattered throughout the state. Yes, they are. And so if you are now looking for additional funds from the USDA, absent some dispensation from the USDA, uh, you will be limited to applying any new money that you might get to census blocks that have not been previously served. Correct. And is that practical? Uh, no. Um, because of the area that um, made up the, the VTEL WOW project, <coughs> Um, there aren't enough census blocks in a large enough geographic mm -hmm. area to make a project make sense. Okay. You so you have to then get blocks. some sort of an right. exception or waiver from the USDA, and is there a process to do that, and has anything been done to move you along those lines? The USDA is writing rules for the e-connectivity pilot project, mm -hmm. and they, uh, 
they had a comment period and we submitted comments okay. to that effect. Yeah. And what, what's the timeline before, that, that will be involved both in the review of comments, the acceptance of comments, and the publication of a final rule or, or, or procedure or process or whatever it is they do? Do you have a sense I, of what the timing is? I believe it's a few months. I'd have to review the, the federal APA. It follows the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, the comment period is closed. I believe it closed September 10th. So but they have the goal comments. is to have the comments allow the USDA to make some sort of an exception that would allow us to be eligible for this, this program. Correct. Okay. On, on two fronts, just to give you comfort, Senator, we have followed this process and filed our comments. Um, but my own reflex when I heard about this was to say there has got to be a better way. And this involves engaging our federal delegation and to simply pr pursue as a matter of, you know, a, a cry from the heart. I, there must be a way to waive this. And so you can be sure that that is going to be brought to the agency's attention. Uh, whether they're listening is another question, of course. Well, it would seem as though that this would be a problem that almost any state that's ever applied for a grant yeah. would have. I, I would, well, yeah, I, I won't speak to that. Intuitively, I think you're right, but then I consider our geography, and given the smallness of our state and how the connectivity issues are sprinkled and the impact of the veto project, it wouldn't surprise me if we are differently situated from other states that um, have different circumstances. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to speculate beyond that. Uh, you know, it's my understanding, so, First of all, the WOW project was supposed to cover virtually every last unserved address in the state of Vermont throughout um, all of our rural hills and valleys, and that now we, the last I knew, we were at about 10 percent. of. So that was around 30, 35 uh, addresses that were to have been covered, and now we're at about 10 percent, um, almost 10 years out. That was my last understanding, I guess, um, if there's confirmation. If not, um, is it more than that at this point? Do we have any sense? I don't have any confirmation okay. of, of uh, the reach of the VTEL Well Project. Okay. Uh, so I would like to encourage um, continuation uh, uh, of this because for our rural communities uh, that have uh, no alternatives, uh, and that don't have the financing, the USDA financing is potentially a very key um, tool for them. And I'm not aware, are you aware of other uh, rural infrastructure funds uh, for last mile build that are of that size and significance? Not of that size, other than the, the Connect America fund. Okay. And the other question I have is, I know Before we have a new, you I'm sorry. Before yeah. you had mentioned you want to encourage continuation of this. And by that you mean the advocacy? Yes, to, yes, yes. and I think um, to the extent that this committee can be helpful, um, you know, I'd like to ask, have you had an opportunity, I know there's a new state director for USDA, are we engaging that? Yes. Okay, and would it be helpful for us to engage them? I think all hands on deck. <laughs> So, yes. I mean, that may be something we want yep. to think about, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, at the next meeting. Is okay. the, the more voices in official mm -hmm. capacities that are mm -hmm. heard, the better, mm -hmm. absolutely, yep. because uh, it, it's very reminiscent to me of Tropical Storm Irene and the progress that Vermont was able to make because it was willing to articulate in every venue possible the unique circumstances facing Vermont, which were very different from how FEMA administered uh, relief in, in states mm -hmm. more typically affected by extreme weather. We've had good success in that direction before, and so I think it's um, very helpful if you are engaged as well. I have two, one other question and one Bless comment, you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, just briefly. Um, first, I want to thank uh, I want to thank you, Commissioner, uh, and also Secretary Quinn. Um, given the level of uh, issues that we have had in my neck of the woods, I know that it's not the only. I, I know we've seen it throughout. I want to thank you for coming and hearing from the Vermonters in my neck of the woods. That situation, as you know, is pretty urgent and yeah, ongoing. Indeed. Uh, the second is, um, my sense is um, that you all could use maybe some more manpower. Is that something that? Uh, woman power. Thank you. More woman. Thank you, Senator. More staff. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. More staffing. Is that something that we could anticipate? Is that something on the horizon? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Um, if you talk to your uh, colleagues um, on the Joint Fiscal Office uh, or a, a Joint Fiscal Committee, 
um, you will see that we testified in front of them yesterday about uh, budget woes that the department and the Public Utility Commission are experiencing. So in a perfect world, uh, I would take 100, 200, 300 employees. Um, this is not a perfect world, and so um, I'm loath to tell you that more staff uh, is necessarily the key to greater progress, but it, at this point, it, it has not helped that we've had a vacancy. It has not helped that we've had um, an emergency mobilization, but these are things that you simply have to do as a matter of connectivity. Of you have to be equal to your responsibilities uh, as a nation as well, so I, I would not have this employee do anything but be mobilized. But I, I don't know that I can responsibly say to you, um, yes, uh, please send us more people without being able to be sure that you're sending us the money that goes with it. That's the, I mean, one of the things that we've noticed in the way the workload of the agency has changed over the last 10 years is the number of unfunded mandates that we have absorbed. Well, one thing that I think this committee would like to hear is that if you have things that that, that you are required to do by law, such as produce a telecommunications plan on time, if you're not able to do that, to let us know and to perhaps give us a sense for what your prioritization <coughs> is, uh, if there's something that isn't going to get done so that we have a sense of what it is. Fair enough, Senator, although I would like to clarify that we are not late to beginning the plan. I am late in the commitment that we made to you last spring. We, we said to you it would be done by then, but as a matter of law, we're not late. Well, I thought that the plan was due in 2017. It's due to be begun, and that we have done. So, I'm, I'm going to shift gears. Is that okay with you? Sure. Okay. So, um, and I'm glad that uh, Secretary Quinn is here. So, right now we have fiber optic cable that is reaching different parts of the state, but not to the last one. So, who owns the fiber optic cable? I'm looking at both of you. Who owns that cable? Depends. Depends. I mean, but basically, a variety of private and telecom providers. The state of Vermont has fiber. Electric utilities have fiber. Velco has fiber. So Velco has fiber. Do any other electric utilities have fiber? Yes. yes. So when an electric utility has fiber connected to its poles, that ownership then is under the under the your your oversight. Um, and and is approved or disapproved or whatever through the PUC. Um, I think it's important for us to um, not give you bad information. Um, so I think um, in terms of the technical aspects, everything I'm about to say would probably be best um, verified by having uh, the um, PUC electrical engineer come in to testify, or perhaps the department. So although our department engineer is not as familiar, or what I'm about to say is that to the extent the electric utilities have fiber, it's specifically for their AMI rollout. So uh, I mean, this is something I was thinking about this summer too. Uh, it was not um, built out to the um, to the power necessarily or the volume to become essentially uh, a replacement for a commercial. So a couple of things then about that. So it, it, so Belco has Belco uh, has more room, and they they have more capacity than they can shake a stick at. So um, we have been in discussions with them. That's good. Have okay. that. That's what I wanted to know. So that's been followed up on. That to well, me is to be really fair, important. That is something the department initiated. Well, it's something I've been taught. I had him a bill two, three years ago. So it's something important, and we all agree it's important, and we need to follow up on it. Well, thank you for bringing that up, Senator, because um, I was not aware of what you had done two or three years ago. Okay, so I, I know that. No, I think it's wonderful that you did, because it goes out, it, it means more than one perspective came to the same conclusion. Yours being more important than mine, of course. So, I mean, the point is that it ex it's accessible if it's owned by a utility, and it's something that we can regulate. If it's owned by a utility, I, uh, I'm clear, just I, I need that question clear, the answer to that. Clear. I think I can help you with that because this is some of what I was looking at this summer. 
Uh, Belco's system, as you recall, is actually regulated at the firm. Right. Now, they do have a CPG in Vermont, and they have one specifically for telecommunications. And that's precisely why I am open the conversation with them to see what used to be made of that. One of the early uh, hurdles that we encountered is uh, how do you go about uh, the use of their cyber system, uh, given that they are regulated at the firm. But these are issues that we're definitely examining, so we're on that track too. And, but there is some legislation relating to their regulation and how they expand and where they move through the state. So there is some of that already to, uh, and that includes the electric transmission. So it would also, I don't know, does FERC regulate telecom? Well, what FERC does. So, it, I think it's a bigger question that I, I'm not, I'm asking just to get that information at some point. I think you're asking all the right questions. Um, they are questions that we're asking too. And the way I would leave it today is you can be sure that to the extent the state has the power to do something in that area, the state is on it like a UN Okay, so um, maybe we can get an update on that at some point. You know, it's not an emergency, but then the other the other the other piece that, that I think is of interest to all of us is um, something I mentioned earlier, and that is how can we look at, and make perhaps an executive session, a contract that exists for our first net? Um, can we see that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there are a lot of assumptions that people are making about that contract and what it means and what it doesn't mean. I think it would be very helpful to us, and especially in light of the emergency situation with the squirrel. Uh, it, you know, so is there a way that we could have that conversation in, a, in a, an executive session and look at the conditions of, uh, of the contract? Because it does have a significant meaning for emergency situations in the state. So um, I'm going to take that as an inquiry from you. Yes. And we'll get you um, an answer. I think the answer has not come from the department, no. but I think we can find um, the state government. That would be very helpful to have. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Rep Representative Feltus, I think you want. Yes, I, I'd like to go back to uh, the USDA program that we were talking about. And I guess I just need a clarification. You mentioned that you cannot apply these funds to areas which have already received some funding in the past. Surely there are areas that have received funding in the past, but why cannot these funds be applied to those areas? Uh, they, they absolutely can. So um, I think what we found, though, is that you have a census block here and a census block here and a census block up here, um, and there aren't a large enough, there isn't a large enough group of census blocks to make a new project make sense. So um, an existing provider, maybe like, um, an independent telephone company or an EC fiber like um, carrier uh, might be able to expand their network in one or two census blocks, but we're not talking about a significant um, kind of statewide or regional project there. We're talking about an extension of, of our existing network. Um, I think it's also important to point out that when the original grant was made to VTEL, and VTEL uh, VTEL's network is doing wonderful things where it is and where people can reach it. Um, but, but that award was made in 2011 um, under, uh, it had broadband or had bandwidth requirements that we now expect to surpass today. So they were required to bring internet of 768 kilobits per second um, to uh, the households that it was intended to serve. Now the USDA is funding projects that has to be uh, either 10, 1, or 25, 3 megabits per second. So, um, you know, that's that's 10, 10 times as fast or 25 times as fast um, as, as that VTEL project. Um, and so there are, if you look at these census blocks, even if they're served, they're served with internet that potentially isn't what the FCC considers to be uh, necessary broadband or what the state of Vermont today is very necessary. Okay. We're mindful of the time uh, that your, your time is, is, is virtually up. I know that there are a couple of additional 
items that are important to discuss, and also I believe Senator Pearson so defer to his question. So maybe we'll go maybe five minutes over, but we, we really should end relatively quickly. I can try to be quick. I, I want to go back to personnel. You um, kind of tipped over around it. Is your budget recommendation going to ask us to fund a new positions, more positions? Or are you staying staff? Thank you for that question. Um, I don't know um, if this is uh, familiar to you, but we are specially funded. Right. So we will be proposing a budget that's based on our special fund. And the issue that we're facing is that that fund at this time is not adequate to pay for our ongoing staffing operations. And this is the subject of the study that um, the Joint Fiscal Office Commission that we're in progress What you talked about yesterday. So I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like yet because um, I think that some of the discussions that the legislature is going to have about this in November uh, to month. So I apologize if it's going no, to cause us to tell you. That's okay. I, it's, that's I think it's prudence. Prudent. <laughs> and then going back to the telecom plan, um, when you have a draft, does that go then out to public comment? No, like, and so this plan would be seen as the blueprint, I'm assuming, for decisions down the road, like we do the comprehensive energies, and that's the one I'm more familiar with. It, it's fair? in that vein, but I wouldn't um, look at it as a, an executive plan, meaning one that you execute on. It's a planning document that spells out a vision, and that spells out the norms and the uh, principles that are reflected in the legislation that this body has passed. Um, it, um, it accumulates um, our best latest information as to the state of um, matters so that you have a picture of the plan. But I think it's important to recognize that it's a planning document. Sure. It's not That's the same as a, as a prescription. Right, which is what our planning documents do. Uh, and then is it good, is it meant to be updated regularly you know, every three years or something? It does have that schedule. So, so help me understand how we're making decisions now, you know, Maybe we could debate whether it's past due. I would argue it is past due. I think our intention was to have it. And we are awarding contracts. We are making decisions. But we don't have the, the process that the legislature asked around the plan. So, so we're kind of hurt for the horse here. And, and I'd like to understand, you know, is it appropriate to sort of stop making some of these decisions until we have the plan? Or, I just would like to better understand the relationship, the interconnectivity there. Yeah, I, I don't think it's. Um, that a pun? <laughs> I, I don't think it's appropriate to stand still. This, um, you know, members of this committee and uh, the public discourse, um, the decisions um, from the PUC, the um, actions taken at the federal level, funding available at the federal, federal level, all pull in the direction of taking action. Um, and I think the agency, using its residual expertise on these matters, takes informed action. It does so on the basis of an existing telecom plan. It's not like we don't have one. And um, these things don't, they, it's, it's like life. Things evolve, things grow. It's very rare that you have um, dramatic departure from one particular uh, plan to the next. It should reflect the evolved circumstances. Does that plan also go out, the 2014 plan, public comment? I was not at the agency at the time, so and I don't know. Speak to it. It. <coughs> so, um, I mean, to, to, in an ideal world, the plan is uh, finished, and it therefore is a resource for um, our <coughs> important partners in the private sector to look to in order to um, best figure out how they can proceed um, constructively in our jurisdiction. But the plan itself is, um, is not the sine qua non of informed uh, federal, I mean, excuse me, state action, and particularly action decision making uh, by my agency. But I certainly take your point that um, the legislature has an idea in mind <coughs> and time in mind for this planning process. And um, the point in my exchange with Senator Brock earlier was not to be um, difficult. It was simply to make the point that as far as the law is concerned, as presently written, well, we are compliant with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
You have two additional items. One is a telecommunications plan, which I think we've largely discussed. The last of the legislative reports and the three reports that uh, you mentioned in your uh, your document. Um, is there anything that you want to bring to our attention? Um, those reports, I assume, each have deadlines, that, yeah, and yeah. are the deadlines to be met? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything that you would want to bring to our attention in particular about either of the, the three? I don't think just the awareness that they're there and it's something that we're working on. And, and that we're mindful of them and um, that I hope um, we are able to give you confidence that um, we, we take the time of uh, our obligations very seriously. We're doing uh, what we can. It's a considerable load. It's one worth bearing. And above all, um, I don't want to take more of your time except to say that um, it is our policy, it is my core value as um, an administrator to be listening to the legislature. So please know that when you contact me, I hear you. I'm always happy to answer your questions, and I really, it's a genuine pleasure to be there having um, difficult times and conversations with you. Well, thank you very much for our coming and for your testimony uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. I don't think I've had the pleasure of doing it. Thank you. The next item that we have on the agenda is an update on uh, Vic Vital. Uh, I'm Dan Smith, who's a JFO consultant. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps, if we can, limit this to about 15 minutes rather than 30 minutes, if that's possible. Uh, well, he's prepared to talk. He's prepared to. He will do whatever you want. He's, uh, uh, he's also issued a report that you all probably should have in front of you. Or hard copy. Yep. Uh, the one reason for the 15 minutes is I think the committee needs to spend uh, a little bit of time discussing what our agenda will be for the next meeting and what and when that meeting will be, be held. Mr. Smith? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is uh, Randy, Senator Randy Brock, uh, uh, and thank you uh, so much for joining us uh, this morning uh, to talk uh, a little bit about Vital. Uh, Vital. Uh, we would like to perhaps limit your testimony to about 15 minutes, if that's possible, if we have another agenda item that we need to cover during the, the last portion of that meeting. Is that is that feasible for you? That's absolutely fine. If you just you know give me the direction as to which. Well, we are the Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee, and if you take that, uh, uh, that, that title as a starting point, I would be very interested in hearing whatever you think is important for uh, you to tell a committee uh, like this about vital. Okay. Um... Well, without, without going deeply into the history of Vital, which I think you're all familiar with, uh, the, the summary of the situation over the past year or so was the evaluation of November 2017 showed that Vital has really not been the best in meeting the expectations that the state had for that enterprise. Uh, that report uh, pointed out a number of weaknesses. Uh, Areas like uh, patient consent, uh, sharing data, and overall effectiveness in being helpful to the health information technology community. As a result of that report, the legislature passed um, Act 187, which set forth a, a number of activities that DEVA and VITAL were going to have to perform over the next year to basically prove that the state should continue with the status quo. Uh, during the course of the summer, both DIA and VITAL have energetically addressed the requirements of that act. They've met the requirements uh, set out in the act with regards to creating a new plan, uh, reporting status, uh, getting a con contingency plan put together so that if things do not work out as hoped, the state has uh, possible directions to go. Um, so they, they've met the requirements of the act as far as looking ahead. So at this point, I would say I'm, I'm fairly comfortable that both Dave and Vital are on track.
track to get this problem addressed and to meet the recommendations of the HIV-HI report. The significant things that we have to look at are really going to happen in the next three to four months. That's when a lot of the planning that Dave and Vital has been engaged in should really start to show fruit and or show results. And the state should have a much better idea of whether the current arrangement is really going to work in the long term. Uh, the recommendation I had in my report was based on how those things go, uh, your committee and others may want to look at uh, whether we're going to continue with Vital as is or make some changes. And the changes could both be in uh, accepting one of the recommendations or options in the contingency plan. The changes could also be the level of looking how the state manages vital on a routine basis. <clears throat> if, if you look at the contingency plan, one of the big things they mentioned for all the options was there, there needs to be a better uh, plan down the road for vital as opposed to what has been the kind of the hand about feeding that we've been doing over the past several years. So for example, if you look at vital right now, uh, the contracts are on a yearly basis, the funding is on a yearly basis, there has not been any real long-term strategic plan for vital. Uh, those are the kind of things that regardless of whether we keep vital as is or we go to one of the options, uh, the state needs to look at how we're going to really make sure that uh, the HIT, HI environment is better supported long term. And I'd like to stop here for a moment to see if you have questions or, or would wish me to redirect the testimony at all. Any members of the committee have questions? Uh, no, there are, there are no specific questions at this point. We could please continue with the testimony. Okay. So uh, basically, I'll, I'll summarize and say I think. Dean and Vital have done a good job so far. Uh, the next three to four months will really be the, uh, the proof of the pudding to, to see if, you know, whether the work they've done is really going to uh, result in meaningful changes and improvements. And then early next year, if there's any doubt whether we're going to maintain our current relationship with Vital, uh, the legislature or whoever they direct should look at that contingency plan and start thinking of the best option before it gets to the point where that option has to be executed. Uh, the contingency plan is very comprehensive. I, I thought it was a very well done plan. It's got a lot of good information. But it's not something that you can just look at and say, okay, based on this, we're going to do that. There's a lot of thought that has to be put into each of the alternatives. And it's the kind of thing that you would not want to wait to the 11th hour to do. So even if there's uh, good improvement in vital, if there's any question that that contingency plan is going to be executed, uh, work should be started early to determine what the best option is. And in terms of that timing, uh, when do you see that? When do you see that occurring? And who makes the decision that it is not likely that this is going to succeed or it is in doubt to the extent of having to think through that contingency plan in more detail. What's the timeline for that, and who's involved in getting to that decision point? Well, I think uh, your committee is going to have a big part of that. Um, a, a lot of it will depend on the progress vitals made over the next couple months, and, and I really think that early in the next calendar year, there should be uh, a solid presentation by Deep and Vital as to where they stand and whether they feel that they're on the path to success or not. Um, as far as who would make the decision on a contingency plan, that has not been established. Uh, I, I guess if it was up to me, I would say if there is any doubt or any consideration that the state is going to change direction, I would task Deva with first going through that contingency plan and, and coming up with a recommendation as to, you know, based on their knowledge of vital and what they can do and the various options, they should come up with a recommendation as to which of the alternatives is uh, most beneficial to the state and has the greatest chance of success. 
As far as who would make the ultimate decision, I would expect that that would be some portion of the legislature, whether it's your committee or the Green Mountain Care Board. But given that Act 187 was an external factor from deed and vital, the decision should probably also be an external mechanism. Anything else that you would like to also advise us of at this point? I guess I would just go back to the overall summary of projects. And I think my feeling at this point is for the projects that the Joint Fiscal Office has looked at, I think for the most part we're in good shape. There are definitely challenges out there. And as I mentioned in the summary, the challenges tend to be mostly related to resources and schedule. And to give you the background for that, if you look at the kind of large projects that the state is doing, whether it's judiciaries, next generation case management system, the ERP upgrade, vision, et cetera, those kind of projects are the same project regardless of the size of the state that's doing them. So for example, a judiciary's case management system is in use by other states. It's a common solution. But the solution is the same regardless of state size. And when you look at Vermont, we have a much smaller state government. We have a much smaller IT division. We have to do the same project work with a much smaller group of people. And that's true not just in our IT projects, but throughout the whole IT enterprise. So a lot of times what happens is even when the people involved are doing the right thing, the stress and the strain and the load on the IT group and the business side of the group can sometimes result in challenges that a larger state may not experience. So for the most part, the projects that we've looked at are in generally good shape, but sometimes just the stress of getting them implemented causes some increased risk and sometimes things don't go as well as you would hope they would. Well, one of the observations I know that I've had over the years is it doesn't seem like large IT projects are within the core competency of state government. We've had this long string of failures, the most recent of which is Vermont Health Connect, which I think most would agree went very badly. And so my question is overall, what are we doing differently to prevent that, the last judiciary failure, the last motor vehicle software failure? What's going to prevent us continuing along those lines in the future? Right, and it kind of goes back to what I stated before is a lot of times Vermont may bite off more than we can chew. In other words, we have good people in the state, we have qualified people in the state, but we don't have that many of them. And when a project is a big project that requires a lot of new thinking and a lot of energy from people, we just may not have a deep enough bench that we can adequately make that happen. I think the solution going forward, or one of the solutions, is whenever possible, the state has to stick to proven solutions. Things that other states have done before and made a success out of, that we can then implement with less of a commitment of people and time and dollars at risk than if we were just going out on our own. In other words, we should stop being first in the nation. Right. Don't be creative. Don't be creative. Right, I mean, as I said, we really have good people, but we don't have that many of them. If you look at a state that has an IT division of 1,000 people, and it's going to take 10 people to successfully implement a project, okay, you could probably come up with those 10 people. But if you look at Vermont, if we've got an IT division of 100 people, and you still need 10 people, now that has a much bigger impact on the rest of the organization. We can't always pull it off. So that, in a way, is my question, though, is, is there another model than that model of mimicking what large states do in order to come up with and implement new projects? There is. 
One is to, as I said, try to build on proven successes in other states. The other is to approach your projects in a much more modular, incremental fashion, which is what integrated eligibility is doing right now. If we were to try to do the whole IE project as one big build and purchase, and we have kind of tried to do that in the past, it would be almost impossible to pull it off. Even those states that have done that have really struggled. But the strategy of looking at smaller pieces that we have the resources to do and doing them bit by bit is a lot less risky and has a lot better chance of success. And that's the approach that IE is taking now. It's still a huge project. It still has a large amount of risk in it. But by doing it smaller, faster, cheaper, I think we can approach it more intelligently. And that's the way to approach it. Is there a single vendor, though, that's been used for that? No. No, it's going to be multiple vendors, smaller pieces, smaller purchases. They're not trying to put all their eggs in one basket. Teddy, Representative Kimball? Yeah, just a question. I mean, because Representative Kimball mentioned that there's been a lot of software implementation that's been used in other states. Is there any evidence that there's been a lot of software implementation that's been used in other states? Yeah, just a question. I mean, because a lot of software implementations fail, especially at the enterprise level, because they're inadequately resourced for implementation of talent. And I think the judiciary is a good example of go it slow and actually take your time and do it right. And that's strong on this report that you've given us. But Department of Labor is weak, and I thought that was an off-the-shelf product used by another state. Is that a matter of reallocating resources? And before you answer that, I mean, the Secretary of State's office has been able to implement a number of different online software implementations successfully. It's not in your report because it's a different branch. But just thinking about the Department of Labor, have we stolen resources from that implementation project and allocated it to a different one? I don't believe so. And I think if Secretary Flynn is still there, he might be able to address the resource issue. The thing with Department of Labor, it's not an off-the-shelf project or solution. It's a solution that was built by another state. And then Vermont went into partnership with that other state, Idaho, to build on that solution. The issue there is the original solution was just for Idaho. It has to be expanded to support Vermont's particular uses of unemployment insurance. There haven't been sufficient resources to make those changes. And there's also some issues regarding governance between the various states involved as far as schedule, who makes decisions, who approves changes, et cetera. So it's a little different from an off-the-shelf project. It's got strengths in that it is a proven solution. We're not starting from scratch. But there are some real challenges to it. On the plus side, there's no funding from Vermont involved. So that risk is low. OK, thank you. Yes, and just if you can add it quickly, because our time is about running out. So Secretary Quinn, if there is anything you do want to add, please feel free to come up and do so. Very briefly, I would just say that Dan Smith's assessment is accurate. They probably are on the weaker side of things. Commissioner Curley, myself, and a number of VDOL employees went to Washington, D.C. on Tuesday to meet with Idaho and the U.S. Department of Labor to work on some of the issues that we've been having. Being in a consortium is difficult. Working with another state is difficult. They had a product. We call it version 1.0. Version 2.0 is being built for the state of Vermont, which then they will turn around and implement themselves. So a lot of the details around that, payment mechanisms, work done, how do they get paid around deliverables, a lot of that stuff was a little squishy in my opinion. But we have a solid plan heading out of that meeting to address all those concerns and hopefully get us back on the right track. But we are certainly on fragile ground right now. Senator Wyman. This is for Dan, actually. The 
the question I have is, you know, you look at the extent to which uh, technology is now uh, affecting our various agencies and air and divisions and departments, everything from labor to health care. Um, in your, from your perspective, are state are any states having difficulty in managing um, the leadership on, for example, healthcare issues or judicial issues, and uh, between the sort of the human component and the technological component, are you seeing any uh, imbalances emerging as a result of the changes that are going on? Uh, I, I'm, forgive me if I don't, you don't answer your question, my question. In the way you meant it. Okay. Um, but, but in any technological change, whether it's an upgrade to an existing system or a change to a new system, there's going to be very difficult human challenges to work through. Uh, you know, people are used to doing their job the way they've done it. And especially if you look at you know, healthcare, Medicaid, and stuff like that, where you may have years of rules and regulation and years of process and procedure that people have become familiar with. When you change the technology, even if it's changed for the better, it can be extremely difficult for the people involved to make that change smoothly. And that is why in most of the projects that are out there now, uh, the change management component is a very critical part of it. It's making sure that people understand the reasons for the change, they understand how the changes are going to affect them, how the changes in technology are going to make their jobs better, hopefully, and <clears throat> how they can be more effective with the new environment. Uh, it's, it's always going to be a challenge. And you know, hopefully, if the project is planned correctly, that challenge will be met. And if I didn't answer your question, please. No, you did. I uh, just uh, one one step further. Um, the who is managing the change in the states that you um, you know you're familiar with? I mean, how is that change uh, being carried on? Here we are in the legislature, and we pass the laws that manage our administration. And so, our, is the legislature managing the change, and what kind of coalitions are forming? to ensure that the transitions are smooth? So at the project level, uh, that's not really the legislature's responsibility, or it shouldn't be. It should never get up to your level. If a project is planned correctly, there should be an identified, experienced change management organization that's involved from the very beginning. Um, that That is the case in the, most of our projects, um, whether it's the ERP upgrade, or integrated eligibility, or judiciary, they all have change management um, organizations that are actively involved in making sure that the project goes smooth. Uh, what we, we want to avoid is having a technology success and an implementation failure. And that's really, that's also part of the reviews that I do. Now, if, if you go beyond the project level to the broader IT level, whether you're talking you know, artificial intelligence or big data, things like that, that's where the judiciary you know, may want to get more involved and, and it already has to some degree. For example, you've got an AI task force that just went in this year. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> Agency of Digital Services is taking a bigger role in looking at the big data question and how state data is coordinated. Uh, those are things that the legislature may want to, you know, keep a little more informed of because they're they're bigger issues than a single project. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, we've reached the limit of our time. Uh, I would like to take the one minute and twenty five seconds we have left, though. All right, Dan. We're uh, going to hang up, Dan. Dan, thank you very, very much. I appreciate your help. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, to perhaps just discuss at least very briefly uh, the timing of our next meeting and whether or not there are any items or issues that we think are important. And what I will do, uh, just given the, the, the short time that we have, is I will send out a document after this meeting polling you and asking you some of those questions uh, about next meeting, frequency of meetings, and also about issues 
that you'd like to hear about, uh, and then ask that you turn them around, and then perhaps uh, with your permission, Representative Sibili and myself can, can perhaps formulate an agenda and then send it out as a draft for everyone to look at, uh, to agree on, uh, and then proceed from there. Is that, is that agreeable? Sounds good. I would just like to comment on this last uh, discussion we had. There were two reports that were issued recently that came to me, at least because I was on appropriations, I guess. One directly from Michael Costa and Michael Smith regarding vital, and it has some very detailed information regarding vital. And there was also a, the full contingency report that, that Dan Smith referred to. Of what are the six options that they, or they outlined six options of what to do. So those reports are out there in our legislative. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else that uh, we need to do today? If not, we, we're, we're about one second over, according, according to my watch. The only thing I, I always, I feel like I get appointed to committees like this because I'm not 50 yet. And, uh, <coughs> but I don't have oh, yeah, uh, a lot of background. You know, I just, I haven't been super steeped in, in these issues necessarily. And so I'd like to ask if, if there's any space and it makes sense for a little bit of a 101, maybe with Dan next, in our next meeting. And the other question I just have is, would it be appropriate to kind of set a goal for between now and the beginning of session, um, you know, particularly for me, the goal would be a, a broadband plan or strategy or at least understanding what that exists. Of course, we're going to see the plan apparently. Um, but just to help orient, you know, we could probably meet every day between now and January. No, we couldn't. And not get all the work done. So there's just such an enormous uh, authority and, and need. And so to me, I'd like, I hope we can spend some time talking about, you know, a couple of goals we have by the end of the year. And also, just as some making sure that we have a sufficient overview of the scope of, of what it is that we've accepted responsibility for. And so some additional briefings uh, would, would, would likely be very helpful. I think also uh, that, that I'd like to invite uh, the state auditor in uh, with perhaps his director of information technology audits to talk about audit strategy, pre-implementation reviews, and those kinds of things that are also relevant to some of the things that we're talking about. So, do we have a motion to adjourn at this point for, for today? So moved. Second. Favor? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you.